Hare Krishna. Thank you for joining today. Hare Krishna. So I was thinking we could discuss today on the topic of monasticism, and we could discuss it in broadly three parts: one historically, or ge and geographically, how monasticism has been understood in terms of how it is practiced and how it was seen to contribute to society. Then we'll talk about in the Indian tradition and in our and including our particularly our tradition, how monasticism has been seen and how it contributed to society. And then we'll talk about in today's world, what does monasticism mean and how can it even make sense? And then can it be relevant for people in general in today's world? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'll begin with uh, a very broad sweeping idea of uh, the word monasticism. The Greek word monos is the root of it, mm. alone, single, which means that this particular person, although being a part of the population, has decided to remain single, isolated, and uh, for various purposes, we shall examine whether these purposes are uh, benevolent, sublime, or is this person just uh, shirking away from responsibilities? Christianity, Jainism, uh, Taoism, uh, Vedic Sanatana Dharma, Hinduism. So these are some of the religions which uh, Buddhism, they take a very congenial view. Uh, the Buddhist, uh, their old language was Prakrit or Pali also. So the word Bhikkhu has the strong con uh, connection with Bhikshu. Hmm. And uh, Bhiksha means arms so you beg from society and obviously you give something back perhaps this uh, aspect has become a little bit fuzzy in today's times as to what exactly does a monk give back that mm -hmm. seems to be some subject of uh, scrutiny but otherwise christianity buddhism jainism vedic sanatan dharma they treat the idea of monasticism very kindly and uh, they have deep roots uh, a lot of theology, uh, structure, order in Christianity, for example, the most famous example is the rule of Benedict. Mm. Uh, there's a nice Latin name, I forget right now. But then uh, the ideals of poverty, there is nothing quite early, isn't it? Fourth, fifth, fifth, fourth, yeah. fifth century, something like that. Yeah. Oh, soon uh, after Christianity no, was born. No, Benedict is much later. The oh. 13th or 14th, 15th century, something like that. But poverty, I don't lay claim to a single unit of currency or a single cent or a single paisa. Uh, chastity, I, I, I vow to devote my body, mind, soul solely in spiritual pursuit and uh, having a strong um, like uh, dislike or aversion towards any carnal pleasures. Uh, obedience, while living in a monastic order, there is a heavy, heavy, heavy emphasis on strong obedience to the structure and stability. I look at it not as six months, seven months, or a kind of a detour from my current life situation, but till the point of death. These are some very common themes found throughout the monastic orders, uh, cross-section of all uh, religions. We find that Islam and Judaism, they just don't have, and Zoroastrianism also, not such a strong liking towards being a monastic. And uh, uh, this could be due to so many factors. We may not be discussing that right now. But what is essential is, and uh, you can take it from this point, that is the point of contribution. Okay. What does the monastic order contribute to an individual's development and to the individual giving something back to society? Yes. Yeah. So this is uh, precisely a. Uh, I was thinking of taking, uh, adding, making an additional point about yeah. his historical acceptance or prevalence of monasticism, and that is very much related to the idea of giving back. Even within Christianity, the Catholic tradition has 
a place of a place of respect for the monastics for the for the monks usually they are called the priests there uh, but protestants are vehemently against against monkhood in fact martin luther who was himself a monk and he was the pioneer of the christian reformation he wrote a scathing critique of uh, monkhood of of uh, the celibate life and then he married a nun and so th thereafter protestants have been highly unsympathetic toward monkhood and we see in america it's mostly protestant and the whole idea of if you have a pastor the past it's pastor and his wife they are always couples who minister to the congregation so now can you summarize some of his major objections you said yeah i'll just come to that he was so one of the okay. main things he actually uh, he, what the same thing that he felt that the monkhood was giving nothing back to the monk the priests were the celibates were giving nothing back to society so he had three main objections that it is it is unnatural that was his main thing and it, it is i think in the bible there is uh, old testament is saying that you should be fertile and produce and expand so he said he felt that this is against uh, our tradition so it's it's unnatural god has ordained that man and woman come together and uh, unite and procreate so first thing is he felt was unnatural second was that he felt it leads to degradation now if we look at the history of the catholic church uh there are unfortunately you know, there there many in the catholic church's annals and this has been investigated and it's not private knowledge that often uh, the celibate the, the supposedly celibate priests would have uh improper relationships and they would even have uh children through that and then a part of what the congregation would give as a donation would be used to for the upkeep of these children and this this went up right up to the popes so apparently at that time martin luther's time he saw this pervasive uh, pervasive corruption which he felt and he said that this is unnatural it leads to corruption and he he felt that it creates an unnecessary distance between uh, between the lay practitioners and others it places others on an unless place this monks on a, on a excessively high pedestal and makes people feel people in general feel that they have no access to god directly so so he 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 wanted to break the priestly monopoly on on god or priestly monopoly on performing the sacraments and he was quite vehement about it so overall Now, if it happens that the, uh, the monastics uh, mon monastery is not seen either leading to the monast the monks own personal upliftment or not contributing to people's upliftment then it will come in for trenchant criticism so that's what happened and i would say that the other religions also now in islam also there are definitely uh, statements about how one needs to control oneself the extent of sense control or self control might not be uh, the same in various traditions but there also it is said that, that so for example mohammed says that you might be lured by your enemies if you if you fall to temptation and you may lose what what is meant to be won by allah something like that so so there are statements about the need to control the senses but what is the specific measure of controlling the senses generally religions that have been more uh, world affirming in in one sense those religions which see god's blessings as coming in this world also if not primarily if not entirely at least significantly primarily significantly coming in this world then for them the renounced order doesn't make much sense so in christianity we have the prosperity theology even in we'll come to our tradition later but even in the the path of karma kanda where there's pious religiosity 
there the renounced order is not so much uh, thought of it is more that you be a householder and you get the good things of life by worshiping god so so that was is basically those were his objections martin luthers you would like to address some of them no you you have taken this uh, fairly recent uh, i mean recent it's still centuries old but uh, since now we are at this particular cusp where we want to see how does a member of the monastic order contribute towards his personal progress and then we'll come to yeah how does he help society okay so let's uh, i think this I, i would like to address these objections but we'll probably come to that in due course when we address what modern monastic contributes um, but if we have done this global overview maybe we can come to the indian tradition now okay. from what i have read uh, at least from now, now the indian historical record is very sketchy uh, there it said that indians were uh, for india because it's a tropical country so manuscripts don't last for very long and prominently it is the oral tradition the so the sacred messages are transmitted through the oral tradition so even the date of when buddha lived that itself is a disputed date so that's why we don't have very explicit contemporary historical records of uh, or rather historical records as per what is defined as history in the mainstream academia but what they say is that the the monastic orders started flourishing uh, when buddhism and jainism were flourishing in india that means approximately from the 5th or 4th century bc and in response to that shankaracharya also uh, uh, established the akhadas so now there were always sages uh, but they were more we could say individuals who would renounce to the world and uh, live separately but is in terms of the historical records it is what is said is within the within the hindu tradition on sanatan dharma it is uh, the it is shankaracharya who who pioneered monasteries as a as we could say almost a organized setup if we see in the ramayana and the mahabharat it is described that when vishwamitra takes ram and lakshman to his own hermitage where where he's going this performing sacrifices and ram and lakshman to protect the sacrifices so there are many other hermits over there also there is described valmiki he had his hermitage and interestingly he had there were she hermits also and sita was interested to her, them and they treated like her like a daughter of her so basically the idea of hermitage has been there uh, uh, for a long time and it seems to be we have the great uh, bharat king bharat after whom the whole bharatvarsha is named yeah. he was he found shakuntala with kanava muni ashram so kanava muni is a i don't know whether he was a family uh, rishi or he was uh, celibate but he did have that even in the ramayan time we have rishashringa living in a hermitage so somebody preferring not to live in the hustle bustle of a town or a city is something which is in the sanatan dharma tradition very very old okay so well, that means you know we could say there are different you mentioned some values of monasticism so yeah. one could be celibacy but another could also be simplicity and uh, so simplicity means uh, it is one lives away from the complexities of city life and one just simply lives based on whatever nature provides or whatever one can cultivate so then simplicity celibacy and then what was quite central is spirituality so we have celibacy simplicity and spirituality now in the yoga traditions when it is said tamo uh, what is that brahmacharya is considered to be one of the yamas so now the some yoga teachers say that that brahmacharya is inclusive and if one is married also then one is a, as shri prabhupad would say grahastha brahmachari so we could have this we could have monasticism as referring to specifically monks who live, have vows of celibacy but 
uh, monastery itself, if we can take it as a general principle, you could say that apart from celibacy, there are also the vows of, there are also the principles of simplicity and spirituality. So that we could have a more inclusive understanding of monasticism also, where more important than the specifics of one's, uh, say, one's uh, marrying or not marrying, the overall values of one's life are more important. Yeah. Do you want to talk something more about the Indian tradition and our tradition also? Uh, I, I will take that uh, when it comes to the modern part. Uh, you, you had said something like those pendulum model. Should we take oh, okay. that now? Okay, so um, when we talk about mon monks contributing or not contributing to society, so <clears throat> when we talk about what is what will inspire somebody toward monkhood, it could be at one level the simplicity, simplicity of living could be there, but unless there is some amount of spirituality, now, spirituality can have different meanings for different people. But overall, in the pre-modern times, it was generally understood that this world is a transitional place for us. And based on how we live in this world, we can attain a better place beyond this world. And that can be an eternal place if we have developed love for the eternal. So the idea is our consciousness can get caught in small things, in petty things which are, uh, which are of not much lasting value. Say an alcoholic's consciousness gets caught in the bottle of alcohol. Wherever they go, that's what they think about. I say somebody else, maybe their consciousness is caught in money. How can I earn more and more money? For somebody else, their consciousness is caught in prestige. How many people, how many heads turn to look at me when I walk into a room? Somebody else's consciousness is more elevated. They're thinking of, I want to read and learn and discuss and uh, become wiser. Somebody else's, they have understood wisdom means to pursue the eternal. And they're exploring life's ultimate purpose and pursuing the spiritual reality ultimately. So like that, we could say one's consciousness can get expanded and elevated to higher realities. So monks are seeking to elevate their consciousness toward the eternal, toward that which is enduring, toward beyond this world. Now, in different traditions, the conception of the other world may vary. It needs specifics. So Buddhism may talk about Nirvan. Uh, then Christianity may talk about uh, life with Jesus. In the in <clears throat> the Advaitic tradition, somebody might talk about uh, oneness. Now, those specifics vary, but the idea is there is something beyond this world. So, and by raising our consciousness, we can attain that. Now, the significant thing is, if we raise our consciousness, we can actually live better and happier even in this world because we are not so dependent on life's ups and downs which can which can shake us and uh, make us miserable so with this background of understanding that the importance of raising consciousness let's look at this uh, simple model If we consider the consciousness of a monk, why would somebody take monkhood? So it could be a one extreme would be they want to raise their own consciousness, but they have no desire to raise others' consciousness. They just mm. retreat out of the world. So it could be to some extent called a little self-centered, not caring for the world at all. Now the other extreme could be that they, somebody just takes on the garb of a mark, monk because it is respected in society, but they don't raise their own consciousness, nor do they do anything to raise others' consciousness. They simply, uh, they simply uh, just uh, delight in the respect and the privilege of, of being a monk. And I think Martin Luther rebelled against this. That this idea that if you are actually not spiritualizing your consciousness, you're doing the same sensual thing that everybody else is doing. Maybe you're doing worse than what others are doing. 
and then you claim to uh, claim a high moral and spiritual ground that is uh, that is reproachable in fact we see we see this third thing it is condemned by krishna also in the bhagavad gita when he says that karmendriyani sanyamya yasate manasa smaran indriyarthan vimudhatma mithyachara sauchita so 360 360 says it's inter- interesting krishna uses two words over there that mithyachara means he is that person is a false behavior or hypocrisy means he is deceiving others but he also says that person is fooling oneself also uh as them indriyarthan vimudhatma but that person is a fool they may be fooling the world but they are fooling themselves also because by fooling themselves because they are also not raising their consciousness they may think they have a raised consciousness but they don't so the healthy attitude for a why somebody becomes a monk is that they raise their own consciousness and they help others raise their consciousness so they provide resources they provide inspiration they provide uh, a rational philosophical and intellectual rational for raising others consciousness and this is what could be the contribution of monkhood to society and when religions do not have monks not monks of third category and not monks of the first category but of the they don't have monks of the second category but if they have of the third category or if that's what they have experienced or if they have experienced the first category only then they feel what does monk could contribute to society at all so then they might also become rejecting of monk could but in general monks can play a very significant role in in demonstrating and reminding society of the need to raise one's consciousness that the religion is not about god i am here you are there you please help me fix my problems over here rather god you are there i am here and please help me to rise up to attain you and it is not just that some magical act of grace by willard which will attain him but is that we have to consciously raise our consciousness become filled with god consciousness so this could uh, be one model by which we can understand the contribution of monks any thoughts about this yeah two points uh one is that now now although we are taking a, a theological angle at monasticism i'm just trying to see whether there are any real life day to day examples so the first thing which came to my mind is let's say there is a law school or there is a medical school and obviously medicine and law both are highly prized vocations in the contemporary world so every doctor who comes out of that at least in india they can have their own dispensary or they can have they can become consultants and earn a lot of money obviously a few of them maybe only 3% or 2% of those brilliant medical students if they have a inner urge to teach so they don't go and practice privately but they teach so that the the parampara the tradition of providing knowledge can be continued so although there is a lucrative way of making money at least in somebody's heart if at all that person find that that may not give me much satisfaction hmm. so 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 at least in the vedic sanatan dharma we have that kind of a uh, scope that if you feel that this is what you should do then this patan patan you teach so this is the duty of uh, not necessarily a monk but but a teacher so so that is one point that if one can introspect and find that this is one thing which should make one happy this is one should exercise that secondly i see like there are sports is a multi billion dollar business at least in in the west uh, and now it is in india also for let's say for example cricket there is a fielding coach a specialist coach mm. there is a bowling coach there is a there is a there is a running coach in a football match 
the coach doesn't go and run around in the field because every member is busy running around and just trying to take possession of the ball but here is one person who can take a bird's eye view and actually he may know much more about the game even than those who are participating in it the same thing has come in the business field with the business coach so you are doing your business you are a marketing executive or a operations executive whatever the life coach they just say that we will have one call per week one and a half hours you just tell me things which are happening and although i am not involved it's like that detached involvement so a monk is not exactly involved in the day to day grinding of society but because of the vows of simplicity purity poverty and obedience he can give a much better clearer way or a or a view of life so the uh, objection is how do you know about life you don't how do you how can you guide a family when you don't have a family that's what i was thinking when you said you know somebody the fact is fielding that, coach they have probably yeah. fielded themselves they have practiced they have been a cricketer <laughs> before so that is the thought i had in mind also yeah no but then those who those who say that you don't have family but how can you guide a family but yeah. surprisingly armed with wisdom people who have absolutely no family experience can be the best guides for others in their family life because there is one angle of life where you cannot get a clear view because you are kind of involved you need somebody who is detached and if he is according to you the second category monk who wants to raise his consciousness or her consciousness and also to help others then it is possible so so the first thing i said was about somebody trying to be the teacher and uh, the monastic order one of the major things which they give back to society is wisdom mm. so that is a that is a lawyer or a doctor not trying for a private practice but teach and secondly the coach the in sports coaching or business coaching they have this kind of detached involvement they can give a better angle so these two points came because of your uh, second model where okay. somebody is interested in this vocation of monkhood precisely for two things help himself or herself and help others okay that's beautiful so now what exactly would a monk guidance be would it be about how to live in this world better or would it be how to how to live so that one can go to a better world because the monk's primary interest would be to go to the next world in fact i read a interesting definition of monkhood or a monk is one who has sacrificed this world for the next world so it may not universally apply but that's one understanding that the 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 pleasurable things of life in this world are what are given up by a monk so that they can attain something in the other world so so then will the monk be able to guide about both things because at one level yes everybody needs like a compass to know where i am going where i should be going that the, that that your compass that but what if i am facing storms right now i want to ultimately go to a better world but i want to live better in this world also so can a monk offer both guidances uh there is this concept uh, given in the ishopanishad by shri prabhupada where comforts of this life and this world are compared with the 98.6 degrees uh, fahrenheit temperature which is okay. a, a normal temperature for a body anything lower and that means you are not properly situated anything higher means fever so without guidance whether from monks or from uh, whoever whether they are have people having families but are wise so what is like a monk has the best chance of 
giving wisdom because that's his only vocation that's the assumption but there will be exceptions also so people who are devoted to pursuit of wisdom they are society tells them okay this is your department we will help you with all other needs so like in the sanatan dharma tradition the monks begging is not considered being parasitical it is not a lazy person who comes and begs the monk goes door to door to enlighten the householders they get a chance to give something back so it is always this person is giving much more than what he is taking from society hmm. it's only when it is reverse there is no clear giving back to society and instead like there are one or two major practices which people are very angry is the selling of indulgences like somebody said yeah, i have that martin luther martin luther's one of the biggest objections was that also yeah so so in one way today the whole Maybe you can world explain is going you can just explain for our yes what selling indulgences okay. means so so selling of indulgences is okay i told a lie i cheated in some business or i committed some theft i committed an injury or i did this or did that so rather than giving that person wisdom as to how they can bounce back from that setback they were told that if you just donate certain amount of money or if you can say so many prayers in a mechanical way i assure you that now that sin will trouble you no more yes in so, fact that went to such so an extreme that, that they also said right. that if some of your relatives have died and they had not accepted the saving grace of jesus then you give some handsome hefty sum as a indulgence and they will be transferred directly from hell to heaven by your giving donations over here like that so exactly. it, yeah yeah so so the the, the point of middlemen today's arms contracts or business dealings or banking everywhere things happen just because there are people in between like a simple thing i had to renew my passport so i had a choice do things on my own and right. put in 6 7 hours of work or somebody said just take the help of this person and uh, you pay him whatever 3 4000 of course i didn't do that because i thought that uh, you know i can't do it myself but the point is that they always have this kind of a role to play a a monk in a good sense now i'm talking only from a good sense he or she becomes a middle person so as to help but in this age of quarrelling hypocrisy where it becomes a impediment so no wonder that people feel if the transcendence is all pervading i would rather approach it on my own i don't need any so the malpractices completely overshadow the the real role of a of a monastic order and and therefore we have luthers who the very word protestant is they they are protesting against something hmm. and uh, so this this element of purification and this element of uh, if i can use the word iconoclastism like somebody icon means a Uh, kind of a image which has become very hallowed and very pure and somebody comes and breaks it so hmm. in the in the in the sanatan dharma we have uh, uh, rishis munis and surprisingly many of them are actually family people they have they have families they are householders so the the idea of very strictly celibate or not having any kind of position they have some meager positions but primarily they were engage in agricultural activities crop protection and uh, medical care in fact two of the uh, you can say not major but quite helpful vocations one concerning medicine and one concerning astrology would be the domain of say traveling mendicants and they would give these two yeah. completely free of charge so even the least uh, resourceful from the financial point of view members of society 
were not denied <coughs> these services. So monks have always played. Uh, coming to your point, as I'm connecting the loop, I'm just turning the end that we need some amount of comfort in this world. Monkhood is not masochism that you just torture yourself, trouble yourself, and that's how you gain the attention of the divine or God. And uh, that means certainly not have many people getting attracted to it. Two things, uh, if, if two things happen, if monkhood is seen as a very cushy, comfortable kind of life where everybody respects you, and we have these three things which we call the three ways of subtle sex life, profit, fame, adoration, which is more deadlier than gross uh, lust. So that becomes attractive. And that's why we have people who are completely unqualified may rush in and try to become monks. And uh, or you see the same politics, power mongering or whatever you see in the outside world, you see the same thing in a monastic world. So people would say, why become one? And therefore, there is a big kind of opinion against it. And at the same time, if there is massive unemployment, people don't have any jobs or something. And then you go to a monastery and you feel that, okay, this is much better. I can. So anything happening, cataclysmic events happening in the material world, history, like Second World War, there was a uh, like a queue to join the ashrams or monasteries or abbeys at that time. Because all this engineering and science and technology, the high point of development, at least from the 20th century's point of view, just ended in massive world wars. People became introspective as to what is the purpose of life. This lasted only for 20 years, by the way. The 60s began with big prosperity. And suddenly the flower generation, the hippies, they became very prominent. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's true. Like, I'll just end with one thing. One friend told me of, uh, in Europe, a young person faced with, so this is the 19, end of 1980s or 1990s. Still, there were no mobile phone technology and other things. But there was terrorism, there was unemployment, social unrest, the youth were not being guided properly. So one person said that, I feel I can only do two things either become a terrorist or a monk. So what he meant was, take this world very seriously, all the problems and everything, and therefore become a terrorist and just kind of eliminate those who you feel are wrongdoers. Or so his idea of terrorism is more like vigilante justice. Vigilantism, yeah. Okay. Or just take another view and think that this whole world is illusion. This whole world is insignificant. There is nothing of any value here. Become a monk and try to gain the other world, as you say. But it is not that easy. So therefore, the Acharyas, as we see in the life of Prabhupada, he encouraged people to be comfortable here, be wise, try to follow the rules of the monastic order, in your own small way, whether in your family or in your occupation, but then don't lose sight of the true north. And the true north is that this is what you have to gain. So the monks are there. They are there to guide people. The monks and the lay people, the congregation, as I say, their lives are not the same. They have different rules, different protocols. Mm. But the goal is the same. Goal is the same, yeah. So this uh, brings me to a couple of thoughts that uh, you talked earlier about how some, some, in some orders, the monks consider basically the world is a field of illusion and temptation and one just has to turn away from it and go to God. The yeah. other extreme is where you think the world is the arena where we receive God's blessings. But the, at least in the bhakti spirituality, 
it is not that the world is the arena of god's primary blessing or god's blessing not as the world arena of temptation alone the world is the arena of sac- service and sacrifice and we see in two of our prominent acharyas something very similar that they left a sacred seclu- sacred secluded place you could say and they entered into the world shri prabhupada in vrindavan from there he went to new york to try to help raise others consciousness and before him his guru bhakti siddhanta he was living a very austere life in mayapur and his father and his spiritual mentor bhakti no thakur told him to to actually or as i think jagan go gaur vishal baba ji his guru, guru told him and basically after that uh, he based on the advice of his elders he came to kolkata which is which was a metropolitan city quite opposite to the a uh, spiritual secluded rural atmosphere of mayapur at that time so there is this idea of world engagement engaging with the world for elevating the world and it is not just that we elevate the world but by we trying to elevate the world we also get elevated so if we consider that in today's world i would like to address at one point i think we addressed some of luther luther's objections one is that it's hypocritical the other is that it's it's like a monopolizing access to god well it's not monopolizing access it is that we need living examples of what a god centered life is like or not is a god centered god life devoted to god and then that helps us move forward so i often say that a guru is not one who comes between us and god rather a guru is one who shows us how to remove what is between us and god our own misconceptions our own illusions our own impurities so the spiritual teachers they demonstrate to us uh, what a life which is free from these are like and we get to go in that direction thereby now the third point of unnatural that's a big subject but one thing especially in today's world is that we do see that there is to the extent romantic love has been glamorized to the extent it has been found to be anticlimactic and so many people are are dissatisfied even frustrated with uh, with romantic relationships and that's why we have marriages breaking apart we have people trying various ways of trying to find some some way to make things work so it's a, so instead of over emphasizing romantic love in the monastic order it is that there are friendships and friendships among people who are like minded who share the same values and the same ideals and uh, i think that could be a uh, that could be a basis for a life of richer relationships for everyone when the idea that we everybody has some perfect partner out there like people say mr right or miss right and whatever and they live in that utopian that dream and then the reality never lives up to the dream and people get frustrated so to say that one way of living is unnatural and the other is natural well even the natural is not uh, especially when the natural is glamorized it doesn't work out all that great so yes we human beings need to reproduce and most human beings will will do that they will marry and they will reproduce but the idea is that everybody is at different levels of spiritual evolution and if somebody is at a level of evolution where they don't need where they would like to pursue something higher then we can't universalize what is natural for everyone or rather we can't absolutize what is natural for everyone so for a significant number of people it would be natural to be in uh, healthy monogamous marriages but for some people celibacy and uh, simplicity might be a more natural way for them to live and grow we thought surprisingly about- one 
Yeah, surprisingly, one Hollywood celebrity remarked, this male celebrity said, he said, I'm surprised in this country, in order to drive, you have to have qualification. In order to drink alcohol, you have to have a certain age. What about being a father? <laughs> oh, God. That's profound. So, yeah. So, this is how uh, things have come where uh, people need the, the urge to have relationships, but the product of that urge, which means the responsibility to raise children. Surprisingly, some of the best advisors for people how to remain committed in marriage are again monks and nuns who themselves don't have any families. So this again proves the wisdom that you can be a good servant of society, you can help solve society's issues by becoming a detached observer. You are observing, you are there, you are involved. Your, your involvement is there up to the extent of imparting wisdom. But as far as being part of the problem, that you are not. You are a part of the solution. Hmm. The so in today's world, the contribution would be more in terms of of monks could be more in terms of teaching and sharing wisdom of how to live a balanced life where one doesn't get too caught in things and uh, we do see that uh, i was in australia and i was at the where was it at the university of sydney i had a program and usually the students uh, they form various clubs so they have bhakti yoga club or yoga club vegetarian yoga club so this club which was organizing my program, it is called as the Urban Monk Club. Okay. And then I was a little surprised, uh, Urban Monk. And then when I went in, uh, they said that, so it was mostly, it was, I would say almost 60, 70% were girls. And maybe 20, 30% were boys. So I said, why would, why? And it was not just because I was coming for a class, but they said that that's how we have everything. So then is monkhood, uh, uh, how is it related with girls? So that the idea is that uh, today the world monk is word monk has become a little more inclusive. In fact, the idea of a monk is somebody who has who has a certain level of self mastery, who has a certain level of wisdom, and who can share that with others. So urban monk, what they told me was, it meant how you could have simplicity and spirituality some kind of balance, some kind of uh, sense of meaning and purpose in the chaos that is urban life. So, okay. so in that sense, the values of monkhood and the values of monasticism, they, they are universal. The specifics of how they will be applied by different people will depend on their particular natures and uh, situations. But these values of uh, simplicity, of spirituality, of purity, uh, these are important for everyone. Prabhu, can we round up because I think that um, uh, Wi-Fi time is limited to only 10 p.m. Okay. And this, that talk works on that. So maybe we can just uh, round up all the ideas. Okay, yeah. So I'll summarize. So what uh, we discussed broadly, we had a structure in mind. So we discussed about uh, monkhood across in across world religions and what was their contribution and in that we talked about how there was a rebellion against monkhood because the monks didn't seem to be contributing in any special way to society rather they seem to be doing the opposite of that especially uh, so then when we discussed about that pyramid or uh, that pendulum that monks who seek to only raise their consciousness, not others' consciousness. And monks would either they raise not their own or others' consciousness. So the second would be especially detrimental, and that's what most people react against when they are negative, when they are against, say they are against monkhood. But in the middle would be those who are themselves raising their consciousness and are helping others raise their consciousness. And 
then you talk about how primarily the role could be teaching uh, just as in a science school or in law school some people need to become teachers and by that teaching even in a field like uh, in a say fielder fielding coach may not be fielding themselves but they teach how to field uh, monk's contribution in today's world could be that can offer a more balanced way of living and we discussed about is it uh, is it unnatural as i talked about how is it unnatural they don't monks don't come in the way to god uh, between people and god rather they help people to understand what stands between them and god helps them remove those that's and, a very good point and also that if we understand that there is uh, at this world that the world rejecting kind of monks hold that this world is a place of temptation the the religions which simply are too world affirming they see this world itself as a place of uh, god's blessings and then they don't see any need for renouncing the good things of the world but if we consider that the world is a arena of service and sacrifice then we need to be engaged in the world by which we can help others rise and we can ourselves raise our consciousness that's what monk code is about and and then i can we conclude by talking about how the urban monk uh, term was yeah. popular among students in university of australia that monks are those who can give us some wisdom by which we can have some sense of meaning and purpose in the chaos that is modern urban life so in that sense uh, monks could help provide a kind of compass to society in navigating life's journey in a way that is constructive from this life as well as the next life's perspective any thought think to that very good yeah nice thing so thank you very much thank you i am attention and participation yeah